Welcome back. I'm Lana Zak. And I'm Elaine Quijano. And we have been watching a CBS News special report on the unsealing of the indictment into former President Trump. He has been indicted on 37 felony counts related to the handling of sensitive documents found by the FBI at his Mar-a-Lago residence. The president is due in court next Tuesday. There is a lot to uh, dig into here. We want to bring in CBS News legal contributor Jessica Levinson to help us with that. Jessica, you had a moment now to look at this weighty document, this indictment. Tell us about the charges. What sticks out to you? What sticks out to me is how we're dealing with the most sensitive documents that potentially put us and our allies at risk. I mean, what sticks out to me is that these aren't quote unquote lower level classified documents. These are documents that are in some cases, people are read in only on a need to know basis. They contain some of the most sensitive information about our country, about our military operations, about our weaknesses, about our nuclear capabilities. I mean, for anybody who thinks, well, this is just a paperwork crime where he took documents back from the office and he shouldn't have had them in his house. This is so much more than that. And that's one of the big things that sticks out to me. Another big thing here is that there is a recording where the former president apparently says, and this shows his state of mind, I could have declassified this while I was the president, but I didn't isn't that interesting and it's secret. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but that shows his level of awareness, which I think will be part of this case. And then of course, the other thing here is just the number of counts and how they all go to essentially the same thing, which is this intent to obstruct a federal investigation to try and make it basically impossible for federal investigators to ever obtain the documents that, again, are our documents and should not be housed at a private club or private residence because they potentially put us at threat. And Jessica, what else do the facts as laid out in this indictment suggest about, you mentioned a sense of awareness, um, about intentions here of the former president. There were a lot of questions before the unsealing of this document about what kind of fact pattern might be established here by the Department of Justice. What is it they have had to actually work with in terms of evidence um, based on the interviews that they have done, based on recordings that have been made? Um, what does all of this, as you're having a chance to digest this along with us, suggest about intentions uh, with respect to cooperating or not cooperating with the government in its investigation? It's such an important question, Elaine. And I think what it boils down to is there's overwhelming evidence that there was intent not to cooperate. And more than that, there was intent to conceal, to obstruct. Again, of course, we need to be careful that there is a difference between an indictment and a conviction. But let's be clear that the evidence here is quite strong. And it isn't just one piece of evidence. It, it's not just actions that the former president took. It's not just actions that he apparently asked others to take. And these allegations, which we haven't really even talked about, about the falsification of documents where there's allegations that he lied in writing saying, you basically, you have government, you have all these documents back, and they didn't. It's all of it put together. It's his public statements. It's the statements that he thought would never come out because they involved his attorney. But a federal judge found that the crime fraud exception to the attorney-client privilege applied. It's no single piece of evidence, even though there are some really damning pieces of evidence here. It's all of it together that paints a picture of willfulness, of intent. And again, that's what you need to prove these statutory crimes. All right, Jessica, stay right there. We want to bring into the conversation, though, CBS News political director Finn Gomez. Uh, Finn, one of the things that we had heard from the former president leading up to this was um, that this was a witch hunt, that the FBI staged this to make it look like, uh, like it was um, worse than it was. But we're seeing here, uh, among other pieces of evidence in the indictment, things that were texted between employees of Trump at Mar-a-Lago, where contents of some of these bombs Boxes had been spilled onto the floor, uh, and they and you can see in this, according to the indictment, allegedly, that they were marked secret. That these were secret documents and had been so cavalierly thrown about. 
What are you now hearing from Trump's inner circle about how they're responding to the release of this indictment and how it contradicts much of what uh, the former president has used as his own defenses previously? You know, you're absolutely right, Lana. You know, I have reached out to sources close to the campaign, and right now I'm hearing the same that what we have been hearing already, which is it's a political witch hunt. It's sort of falling into that same, uh, those same uh, default setting, if you will, of responses. But the fact of the matter is that this is not, uh, this is significant in, in what it alleges here. I mean, uh, United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of of the United States and its allies to military attack and plans for possible retaliation response to a foreign attack. I mean, that that is that is significant. That is not this uh, you know, to have this information, to have this classified information in boxes where, as you said, so cavalierly placed, so carelessly placed, um, according to these documents. I mean, it causes it, it should cause some concern. I, I'm I'm assuming from some of the Republican field okay. right now also. You have heard this reticence of his rivals to really dive in and attack and criticize the former president for the, the handling of this case, for the handling of these uh, of these docs. But after now facing these 37 counts uh, of real significance, at least according to what I've what we've all perused here through these, you know, through this these these multiple pages, uh, you know, this is significant. And I think that you could be hearing uh, more criticism. You could be hearing perhaps more uh, more of his rivals lean into that space. You've heard Chris Christie, the former New Jersey governor, and the uh, uh, and also Asa Hutchinson, the former governor of Arkansas, who have been openly critical. Asa Hutchinson said that he should end his campaign. Uh, Chris Christie said that he that no one is above the law. And this was before the unsealing of these uh, of this indictment. So after this, when you're talking about national security and you're and you're seeking the nomination to be president again like will this finally be the the cause for potential uh, an, uh, more criticism from his Republican rivals uh, yeah. it, it is it is damning as, as as has been said yeah and Finn remind us before this unsealing of this indictment what Republicans some of them including the Speaker of the House have said about the indictment before we had the specifics of it. Because, uh, for instance, Kevin McCarthy was one of those who began to close ranks behind the former president. What is it we had been hearing up until this point from elected officials? Elaine, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you have heard from the Speaker of the House. You have heard also from uh, Trump's uh, chief rival, if you will, Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, who have talked about how uh, this has been a weaponization of law enforcement by the Biden administration, a weaponization uh, by the DOJ, uh, it just try trying to target the former president and really falling, aligning themselves with the argument that you've been hearing from the Trump camp about this case. But after the unsealing of the, this indictment, this 49-page indictment, um, could that change their argument? I mean, th th could that change uh, what they are saying? Because this is substantive. This is real. This is significant. Of course, you know, th th it's it's all alleged by by the prosecution here, by prosecutors here. Uh, but this is not the Manhattan case, DA case, if you will. This is th this is this is not a uh, hush money payments. Uh, th these are real charges with real legal teeth, if you will. And I think that what you can be hearing and what, what potentially you could be hearing is perhaps a changing of that rhetoric and perhaps a changing of that response. But we will see hmm. so far what so far the early inclination that in the, the early indication that I've been told from sources close to the to Trump world is is that it is, again, uh, the, the repeated phrases of a political witch hunt. But we'll see. Jessica, um, join us on this. Obviously, this indictment is the case made by the prosecution. Um, that these are all allegations at this point. Um, but how does it change the defense strategy? What is the defense strategy at this point for the former president? 
Well, it's getting narrower and narrower. And let's be clear about a couple of things that the former president's first defense was, well, I declassified everything, kind of two responses to that. One, we now see that he apparently admitted that he did not declassify some of the information here. Two, there a lot of the crimes, if not all of them, I apologize for moving quickly, do not depend on whether or not the documents were classified. And so you can still, for instance, uh, convict somebody for obstruction of justice, for portions of the Espionage Act, for conspiracy to commit obstruction of justice, for making false statements, regardless of whether or not the documents were classified in this case. So that's one of the defenses that I think has evaporated. Another defense that um, we've talked about briefly is the idea that the former president really wasn't at the center of this, that he basically aides packed things up. He wasn't really sure that where documents were. And all of the evidence in this 49-page indictment, again, it is the prosecution's case, but it is strong evidence to indicate he's at the very center of all of this. And so I know I'm not answering your question. I'm really just outlining why I think his defenses are becoming much smaller. He can't claim that he had the right to obtain this information. He can't claim that he thought that he could keep this information. Um, and claiming that it was declassified, he really can't go there, and it really doesn't make a legal difference. Uh, Jessica, as you've been speaking, I see that our CBS News White House producer, Gabrielle Ake, who is traveling uh, with President Biden um, at an event in North Carolina, actually asked President Biden if he had spoken yet to Attorney General Merrick Garland. Um, this is the exact quote, I have not spoken to him at all. I'm not going to speak to him. I have no comment on what happened. Uh, this again, President Biden talking to our CBS News White House producer. Um, that was in North Carolina. Jessica, what kind of position is Merrick Garland in right now? Uh, as sensitive an investigation as this is, uh, as this process continues to unfold and the 2024 presidential campaign continues to get underway, um, describe for me what that must uh, be like for his office and those working under him, especially on this case and other cases, um, you know, when they move forward and, and continue with their work, there is a political element unlike any other before. Unlike any other before, I think that's worth emphasizing. And I think your question is such a smart one because it really points out why there was a special counsel. There is a special counsel, excuse me, in this case, because Merrick Garland is aware that he is a political appointee. He was appointed by the current president who is running for reelection and very likely will be running against the former president, who is the subject of this investigation. We now know the target of the investigation and has been indicted as a result of it. So that is why he has said, Jack Smith, essentially, you're it. And that is why you heard President Biden say, I haven't talked to Merrick Garland. I don't intend to speak to Merrick Garland, because what President Biden has said and what I absolutely hope that he follows through with is that the independence of the Department of Justice is important because, again, look at the words Department of Justice. You do not want the Department of Justice to look like another arm of the White House. That's why I think that we will see President Biden and Merrick Garland essentially stay as far away from each other as possible. And for Merrick Garland, he know everybody knows he was politically appointed, but if that means that we don't trust the attorney general, then we need to think of a different way to choose the next attorney general, because in every administration, that is an appointed position. And at a certain point, we have to trust their judgments, even if they have political implications. Jessica, I want to ask you uh, a question about the other person who's named here. It's the United States of America versus Donald Trump and Waltine Nata. Uh, Walt uh, worked as a valet for the former president when he was in office, um, and he is all over this in terms of moving around boxes and, and being involved. Is there a particular legal strategy, Jessica, in having him named uh, as the co-defendant for the former president? Well, I think part of the strategy behind this indictment is giving the public a very full picture of what's going on and not leaving us, frankly, guessing with respect to a lot of the different aspects here. I mean, I let's be clear that I don't know, and nobody except those involved in the investigation 
know whether or not there are discussions um, with Walt Lada about potentially um, testifying against the former president and being granted immunity. So part of this is he is now put on stage, he's put in the limelight, and there may be the strategy to put more pressure on him to try and provide information that would help in the case against the former president. It may be that that's not on the table, that he's already provided all the information that he can because he's legally bound to do so. Um, so the answer is this document gives us a lot of information, but we still don't know the full roadmap to the strategy here. Um, Finn, if you're still with us, um, I just want to get a bit of context as well with the 2024 presidential campaign uh, essentially in, in full swing or nearing that point now. As we look through this indictment, and one of the things that we heard in the special report a short time ago is the number of intelligence agencies that had been affected according to this indictment. Um, as a result of what took place, and uh, according to the indictment, and by Donald Trump's actions. They are the CIA, the Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, and on and on and on. Traditionally, Finn, the Republican Party has positioned itself as a party of the party of sort of uh, strength when it comes to national security. Has national security been an issue that has come to the forefront? I know it's still early in this 2024 campaign. Has there been much talk of that uh, on the campaign trail? Because in previous cycles, that has been a focus of Republican rhetoric. And I'm wondering what we've seen so far and whether perhaps this might change some people's political equations um, based on what is laid out in this indictment. Uh, that's a great question, uh, Elaine, uh, and it, one that I was actually just thinking of, because frankly, it, it has been to some degree a, a, an issue, a top issue in the discourse of this cycle, but not necessarily at the top of the issues of this cycle. I believe that this could potentially, uh, in, uh, it could p potentially raise that issue of national mm -hmm. security to a top one. I think it does give an avenue uh, for his uh, critics and, and rival uh, campaigns to really uh, see a, a political vulnerability when it comes to the actions, the alleged actions by the former president um, in dealing with national security. And, and, and just the subject matter, the subject matter here, Elaine, is so significant that, it, I, you know, and, and for those, um, you know, and there's, there's, there's been talk of uh, potentially Will Hurd, who's a, a, a former Texas uh, uh, Republican congressman, uh, and a former CIA operative, for someone like that who has that CIA, like intelligence background, um, could this be a political opening to really discuss and really focus in on national security? I think it does. I think it does uh, have the impact to to change the game, if you will, and bring this bring this issue to the to the forefront. All right, Finn Gomez, Jessica Levinson, really appreciate all of your insight into this breaking news as we continue to go through these documents and try and understand and bring the very latest to all of you.